Hello and welcome to the CNBC TV 18's Mumbai Newsroom. I'm Sonal Bhutra and with me is Pavitra Parik. You are watching Mutual Fund Corner. Well, you know, Pavitra, more often than not, in the investing journey, we tend to overlook the biggest don'ts and do's uh, in investing and get, get swayed away th by those higher returns in our investing journey. So today, I thought we should actually take a deep dive on what mistakes you should avoid while investing in mutual funds and importantly, understanding the ratios as well uh, when you want to understand the equations better and get better hold on to the mutual fund investing scenario. Oh, absolutely. And for any investor, this is so crucial to know, right? As important as knowing what to do is knowing what not to do. Yes. So let's invite our guest on that note. We have Ashish Shankar of Motilal Oswal Private Wealth to talk all, uh, you know, about this and take us through all of the don'ts that we just mentioned. So Ashish, thanks a lot for joining us. Like Sonal was pointing out, there are several mistakes that, you know, as a guiding principle, you can just have that these are just things you should avoid. So do you want to run us through what these are? If you could just first take us through what they are and then we'll dive into each of them separately. Of course. Sure, sure. Thanks, Sonal. Thanks, Pavitra. Really a pleasure to be on this show and talk to your investors. So there are a few common mistakes that I feel uh, investors should try and avoid. The first one is uh, they need to first understand the asset class they are planning to invest in. I mean, for example, whether it is gold, whether it is equities, whether it is real estate or fixed income. And there are obviously a lot of subcategories. Now, the first thing an investor should do is try and understand the nature of that asset class because every asset class will have its own journey and you cannot compare one asset class to the other. So understanding the asset class is extremely important. Second mistake, and this is a very common mistake that most people make, is getting carried away by the fad of the day. And if you ask me, this is actually the most important mistake that people make. What happens is, you know, there is a crowd behavior and everybody is talking about an investment or an asset class which is very hot and just to give an example cryptos were the craze at one point in time or for that matter the tech stocks and nasdaq was a craze at point in time and we tend to get forced into investing not forced but we tend to invest into that asset class because everybody around us is doing doing the same thing so i think not getting carried away by by the fad of the day uh, is 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 a mistake i mean we get carried away the third is uh, we need to understand that uh, sometimes less is more, right? Uh, 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 a lot of investors tend to keep investing in different products, different asset classes in the, in the name of diversification. But what that leads to is it leads to a portfolio which is extremely cluttered, difficult to monitor, and you end up getting suboptimal returns. And just to give you an example, we know a lot of investors let's say in equity category, they end up investing in, let's say 2025 funds. And uh, actually when you analyze that portfolio, uh, you come to the conclusion that it that investor would have been better off just buying one index, right? Because you've got close to 500, 600 stocks in your portfolio. So that is that is that is the other thing. And uh, lastly, but, but not the least, I think it's extremely important to understand yourself before you embark on this investment journey. What kind of risk are you willing to take? What kind of volatility can you stomach? And what kind of losses? I mean, it could be paper losses, but what kind of losses can you uh, 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 take in the journey? Because at the end of the day, look, uh, wealth is also about peace, right? If you do not have peace of mind, then uh, what's the point in having wealth? So one has to understand what uh, what is, uh, I mean, people have to understand what is their own uh, uh, temperament. Before, before embarking on the investment journey. So these are few of the um, uh, mistakes or uh, rather uh, uh, areas that one needs to delve deeper before embarking on a, on a journey. Less is more. That is something uh, that every investor should keep in mind, right? Yes, the return should be more, but definitely it can be done via a narrow or smaller portfolio as well. So let's move to the basics first. You spoke about uh, understanding the basics of the underlying assets. So the basic thing that we know, the underlying beat equity or be it debt or gold or a mix. Uh, but is that much understanding enough or we need to take a deeper dive into these things? Yes, see, uh, again, uh, you know, there are two points which I mentioned are very linked to each other. That is understanding oneself as an investor and the temperament, and then understanding the nature of those asset classes. So I'll just illustrate this by way of example. Let's take equities, right? Now, when equities is doing well, everybody wants to get on the back banker. Everybody wants a piece of the action. And generally, it happens when the last two, three years for equities have been extremely good and the returns are closer to 15 or 20% Kager, right? But remember, equity 
markets, you know, and I'm just generalizing here, having seen the behavior over the last 35, 40 years, they go through a 15, 20% correction every, every four or five years, right? Every eight to 10 years, you have a big correction. Now, the events that shape that correction could be different every time. You had the subprime crisis, you had COVID, in 2000, you had dot-com. But during these crisis periods, it can wipe out almost 50, 60% of your equity portfolio, right? Now, people who stayed calm and were invested in the right uh, products or funds came out well, even after the crisis, right? Uh, but a lot of people panic and exit. So that is, that is what I meant by trying to understand the nature of the asset class. So if you're investing in an asset class, you need to be very sure how the asset class produces return. Similarly, one more example I'll illustrate to make it very clear. Take gold, for example, right? Now, gold doesn't give you linear returns. Gold could have five, six years where it does nothing. But what happens is what it doesn't do much during good periods, it covers up during crisis periods. Let's take last year. Last year, the world was saddled with inflation. You had a lot of challenges globally when it comes to, let's say, economic growth. And gold turned out to be the best performing asset class, right? And this is happening after a long time. Gold was doing extremely well between 2003 and seven. After that, this is the first time I've seen gold perform so well. So gold, and, and gold is counter cyclical, right? So when equities or the risk asset classes don't do well, gold does well. You have to take gold as a hedge in the portfolio and you have to be very clear that it will perform when nothing else is performing. Mm -hmm. And it will give you that firepower during that period to take out some money and rebalance. So this is what I meant by understanding asset classes a little deeper and matching it to your temperament. Because if you do not have the temperament for a 50% drawdown every 10 years or a 20% drawdown every four or five years, then you should be having less equities in your portfolio, right? You should have more fixed income. Similarly, if you have more equities, then you could balance it by a little more allocation to gold. So during crisis periods, the portfolio remains far more stable. So I hope that illustrates the point. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, this is very useful uh, for anybody who's getting into the markets to know. It's pretty much knowing what you're signing up for, right? Yes, the returns could be of a certain level, but know everything that comes with it as well. Ashish, my next question, and this is something that we try to highlight on the show as well a bunch, is the importance of having a goal, right, when you get into any kind of investing. So tell us, how important do you think this is? Or do you think that if today I have 10,000 rupees extra per month to invest, should I just invest it? Do I need to define a goal? I think uh, having a goal is the most important thing. Uh, reason being that, look, uh, the markets can change, the news flow will change. Sometimes, you know, you are fed with a lot of pessimistic news flow. Sometimes people become extremely op op optimistic. Now, if you do not have a goal, and it's not just important to have a goal, it is also important to uh, write down how you will get to that goal, right? Everybody need not get to the goal in the same manner. But what happens is once you have a goal, you then start working towards it and you have the ability to cut out the noise. So I'll give an example. We all say that the longer term Kager of equities, at least over the last uh, three decades in India, has been close to 15, 16%, right? Now, going forward, maybe it'll moderate, maybe it'll be between 12 to 15%. But once you uh, illustrate a number that you want to achieve, let's say after 20, 30 years, and you know that the underlying asset class has the ability to produce a certain Kager, right? Even if the markets fluctuate in between, you stay calm because you don't need your money after three or four <coughs> years or five years. You need your money after 20 years. So if you can set milestones and goals and you also decide how you want to achieve that goal, then what happens is automatically you decide the mix of asset classes and you decide uh, uh, how much to invest in which asset class based on your risk temperament. So I think goal is probably one of the most important things to have when you're embarking on a financial journey. And the goal need not just be a number. For a lot of people, goal could be preservation of capital and X amount of uh, output from the portfolio. Or for some people, it could be um, you know creating X amount of wealth after uh, 10, 12 years. But for most families, right, a goal is mostly linked to uh, life events, which is either uh, studies of their children or buying a house or retirement, so on and so forth. Okay. 
No, point well taken, right? Without gold, you wouldn't even know whether it's for short term, medium term or long term. Uh, while we talk about these different degrees of investment horizons in terms of timing, uh, same applies to risk as well, right, Ashish? Uh, which risk profile do you think should be kept in mind for different categories or different schemes that one is investing in? Right. So uh, I'm going to keep it extremely simple for your viewers. Uh, in my mind, there are broadly three risk profiles, right? There is a conservative risk profile where you believe that as an investor, you cannot stomach too much volatility or risk, or for that matter, maybe your uh, time horizon is shorter term, or the third category could be where you have gone through your entire life and now you are going to live off the income in the portfolio. You become conservative during three of these junctures. Now, a conservative portfolio typically would have maybe 25-30% allocation to risk asset classes. When I say risk asset classes, it could be Indian equities, it could be US equities, but equities uh, or uh, underlying asset class, which is a little more volatile, but designed to create much higher returns in the longer run, right? 25-30% allocation, 70-75% allocation to conservative asset class, which is essentially nothing but fixed income, and it could be a combination of funds, deposits, so on and so forth. And you could kind of have some allocation to gold as a risk hedge, right? For a conservative investor, you can have lesser allocation to gold because the risk you're taking in the portfolio is lower. Similarly, a balanced portfolio would be a mix of 50-50, 50, 50, 50 risk asset class, 50 conservative. And you can just extrapolate what I said on the conservative to the balanced category, right? 50% can be in equities or equities type of asset class. And depending on the size of your portfolio, it could also be in something like private equity and so on and so forth. And 50% can be to fixed income. Again, in fixed income, there are different categories within fixed income. If you have a larger, large enough portfolio, you could also do things like structured debt and all that. And you could have a slightly higher allocation to both. And the third category is basically an investor who by mindset is aggressive, doesn't mind taking uh, a little bit of volatility uh, during the journey and has a longer term horizon, right? Not dependent on cash flows totally from the portfolio. So this kind of investor can have 70-75% exposure to a risk asset class and 20-25% uh, to conservative asset class. And actually, within that conservative allocation, you can have a higher proportion to gold because on one side, you're anyway taking a high risk. So you kind of uh, balance that out with gold in the portfolio during crisis periods that will come to your rescue. So this is how I think about portfolios. Now, again, like I said, every individual is different. Every family is different. Now, once you have these three templates, you can then moderate it to suit your uh, current uh, requirement and uh, your temperament and your time horizon, right? So 25% uh, uh, conservative portfolio into equities can probably move to 35, 40. If you believe, no, I can take a little more risk. Or for that matter, an aggressive portfolio, 75% can come down to 65% equity. If you believe that 75% is too high risk, uh, for, for me as an investor. What we right. have found from our analysis is 60-40 to be the most optimum portfolio when it comes to risk taking. 60 equities, 40, 40 conservative. Okay, got that. And that really breaks it down in terms of, you know, how you could split your portfolio for a conservative, moderate, as well as an aggressive approach. But Ashish, this has been a very useful chat so far. I request you to please stay on because we're going to get into a very short break and come back. We have lots more questions on continuing with this topic on, you know, the don'ts of mutual fund investing, as well as some of the key ratios that we usually talk about. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hey guys, welcome back. You're still tuned into MF Corner here on CNBC TV 18. And we still have Ashish Shankar to talk about the entire world of mutual funds, what you should really avoid when you get into this space, as well as some key ratios. So Ashish, one question that I really want to, you know, take up with you is on past returns. We try to really educate all of our viewers so much about this, right? That past returns is just not enough when you're looking at what you should get into. So you tell us um, how do you look at it and how important really are past returns? Because of course you can't completely ignore it either. So this is a very interesting question and we keep getting asked this question from most of our investors and clients that should I invest in the best performing fund? Now, the answer is a bit more nuanced, but first let me tell you, looking at past returns is probably the worst way to invest. And I'll explain this. Now, there is a nuanced way to look at returns, right? There is something called rolling returns, where you see how the fund manager is done. Let's take a five-year period, right? 
Uh, there could be one way of looking at returns where you see the point to point five year return or point to point one year return or point to point three year return. Now that's the worst way of looking at returns. When I look at five, when we look at five years return, we look at rolling returns that, you know, there are multiple three year uh, rolling periods in that five years. How has the fund manager done in all these rolling periods? Because that basically denotes consistency. The reason is that just because the last three to five years have been good for a particular fund or fund manager, there is absolutely no guarantee that it will continue doing so in the future. It's like looking at the rear view mirror and driving a car, right? And you know what happens when you do that. So what is a better way of uh, evaluating funds? And, and this is backed by data, by the way. If you look at the top performing funds on a, on a, on a three-year basis, invariably the funds which are ranked at the top a large portion of those funds and i can tell you from statistics almost 70 percent plus of the top performing funds go to the bottom in the subsequent three years now imagine if you're investing only based on top performance you are basically setting up your setting up your portfolio for disaster right because what i'm saying is that if you take the top 10 funds by performance over the last three years point to point right you can be rest assured almost seven out of those 10 funds are going to be in the bottom quartile after three years and you'll be very very disappointed so then what's a better way of uh, looking at looking at uh, equity funds so first as i said you know if you have a long enough history right if you take a 10-year history and we have this process called 4c so we first look at consistency over the last 10 years how many three-year rolling periods has the fund outperformed or done well right second is the class and the capabilities which is capabilities basically you know what is the style of the fund manager because at the end of the day you can be rest assured that process sustains performance necessarily does not sustain process will sustain performance performance by itself cannot sustain if there is no process so we look at the style of the manager and then we look at the you know time periods that the fund manager has been through right if somebody has been through different cycles of the market then obviously you know that they will not take undue risks. And like, you know, I think Howard Mark says, there are there are no old, bold investors, right? People who've seen markets long enough know that, you know, taking binary risk is not good. So if you, so you have to look at the fund a little more uh, holistically before deciding, because once you go through all of these parameters, and, and for this, uh, I know a lot of your uh, viewers are probably investors with not too much access to information. They can use wealth managers, or they can use uh, you know distributors to to get to to get this analysis for themselves because once you're convinced about a fund uh, across these different parameters then your ability to hold the fund during bad periods is much much better otherwise what will happen is you'll invest in a top performing fund the moment it goes to the bottom you will exit and that's the best way to destroy wealth okay uh, Hashish, my director is telling me we are very closer to the we are very close to the end of the show. So I would quickly uh, uh, get in some more questions on some of the ratios that we need to keep in mind while investing in mutual funds. Uh, what is the portfolio turnover ratio? Is this something that an investor should look at? What is better, a lower turnover or a higher one here? The portfolio turnover is uh, you know how many times you are turning your portfolio over in a in a year, right? If you're turning your portfolio over 20% in a year, then over five years you're turning over the entire portfolio. That's what it means. Now, as a thumb rule, lower turnover is better, but it need not necessarily be the case because there are different styles of managing them. There could be a fund manager who has slightly higher turnover, but still, you know, able to get the results that you want. But generally, as a thumb rule, lower turnover is better because lower turnover, uh, you know, ultimately results in lower expense. Okay, got that. Another ratio that, you know, and this is something that there's been a lot of talk about in the past few uh, weeks as well, is the expense ratio, right? So take us through how important is that for investors and uh, how would you see it? Do you, how much do you think you need, really need to study this? And also SEBI is sort of uh, looking at a total expense ratio as, uh, as well. How do you think that will impact investors? Right, so expense ratio is important, but I would say that you know, it's not a deal breaker in the sense that, you know, it, it's not that you should just sort, you know, leave lowest to the highest and just invest in the lowest expense ratio funds. See, what also matters is how the fund is performed and the other things that I spoke about. So in the similar category, I think lower the expense, the better. Okay, in a homogeneous category, if you have a homogeneous category of funds, let's say you have multi-cap funds and you finally selected five multi-cap funds which you like, right, or fund manager you like, then you look at, look at expense ratio. Then the lowest expense ratio is the best. Right. 
a uniform expense ratio across the category of funds will certainly help because you know that's another variable that you don't need to then monitor monitor or track but just because a fund is low in expense ratio doesn't mean that you should take a decision to invest there oh. once you have a short list after that expense ratio can be a good variable to take a decision Okay, all right. We get that point, Ashish. That was uh, very helpful in terms of what not to do, the mistakes to avoid while mutual fund investing, and important ratios as well. It was a pleasure speaking with you uh, today on the show as well. Uh, we'll do one thing. We'll wrap on this edition of Mutual Fund Corner, but you stay tuned for closing bell to take you through the last hour of trading action. <laughs>